I think I think there's a lot going on right now, and I think there's going to be uh, probably a lot of I hate to use disruption because it got overused maybe all day today, but there's a lot of things happening, and again, a lot of that creates opportunity and it creates some pitfalls. And I think if you choose the right road, there's going to be a lot of opportunity, and if you don't, there's going to be a struggle. And that's for OEMs, that's for us, that's for dealers, that's for anybody in this business. So you, you heard the you know, last presenters talk about in one page lots of difficult things, lots of you know headwinds, and we got to fight those. So I think I think this is an interesting time. But I think there's going to be real, real winners in the next three, four, five years. Real winners. So I think the the disparity between the winners and the what's that what's a better word for not winner. <laughs> not, not winner is going to be big, and that's at every level: OEMs, dealers, etc. So, anyone else want to take a stab at it? I'll, I don't want to pick on anyone in particular, Doug. Since it was there, it was brought up about the Chinese buying a company, obviously yours. Maybe you have something to add on that point. Well, we have to, we got to make sure we we say the Taiwanese. Taiwanese, yeah. Taiwanese. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> excuse me. Yes. No, that's fine. Um, oh, you're Chinese. Yeah. Yeah. Over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Korean. Korean, Korean, Korean. acquisition. Still yeah. American. Still American, Korean. China. That's a good point. So there you go. That's a good segue. Yeah. Uh, that's good segue. Uh, I, I agree with Rick. I think if you if you looked at the last presentation, um, one of the things they didn't ask was what happened with the uh, OEM numbers, unit volumes for the last couple of quarters. And if you look at IDC's numbers, um, I know we do. Um, I know. All of us do. They're they're bad. Um, they're not very good. So everybody is seeing a uh, pretty traumatic, uh, some some not good numbers. And I think and it hasn't been that bad for a long time. So I agree with Rick 100%. Chaos creates opportunity. There's no doubt about it. And um, some people are going to win. And I think companies that that you're running and the reason why we're here, this event should be a lot bigger because as chaos happens, there's niches and there's. There's core, you know, value-add products that are add-ons to what we do as manufacturers that are going to change the game, and I think, I, I think that's where it's going to be headed. And I, we're, we're fortunate enough because we got tagged along, we got brought along by a Taiwanese company that's doing very well and has a lot of money to invest. So we, we feel we, and we're in a very good spot right now. Um, but as I look around, I think the one thing that that Rick and I have talked about in the past is, as it gets tougher for us, it gets tougher for us first usually. And it takes a little bit longer to, to bleed its way down into the channel. And I think I think that's where I, I hear a lot of dealers say, I can't believe the numbers are off because my business is up. Um, and that was six to eight months ago, and now I'm hearing my numbers are off a little bit. So I think it's challenging for everybody. But it is chaotic, and I think for the first time, at least on the OEM side, I think you agree. I think we'll start to see some consolidation. Thank you. Jim? You know, this is still a great industry for a long time. Even though it's maturing, there's still plenty of business for, for the dealers. Um, you know, this is our second time around. We were a fax company, and in the early 90s, there were 47 different vendors of fax machines, and by 2001, there were 10. Our best years in fax was when it was actually declining, because more people got out of the industry than the industry was going down. And you're going to see that. So if you run a good business, you will make money. And when industries mature, you're going to have this. Look at the airline industry. There's three now airlines, Delta, United, and American. They do everything. And there's going to be five or six big OEM manufacturers that do everything. Everyone else is going to be Southwest, Virgin America. Well, I don't want to be Spirit, but, you know, guys like that. <laughs> so, uh, but it, so for the smaller manufacturers, and these guys are the larger ones, we have to find our own ways. And that's how they're going to survive. Bill, want to take a stab at it? I think that the only clarity we have right now is that we're going to continue to evolve. This industry is going to keep changing. We're going to continue to see adjacent areas for the OEMs to get into, for the dealers to get into, and, and dealers are going to have to decide for themselves which ones work. They've got to pick revenue streams that they feel committed to, uh, because stealing pages will work for a certain measure of time, but after a while, everybody's after the same game, so that's the race to the bottom. 
So I think we've got to continue to embrace the change and continue to look for the added services and the solutions that will actually drive real meaningful change for the customer. And Mimi? Yeah, so ditto. Ditto. Right? <laughs> Not much more to say, but um, just from the HP perspective, um, you know, gosh, what isn't changing at HP? We've completely turned our entire business model, the way that we go to market, how we talk to our partners and our channel and not only our suppliers in such a different way than we did a year ago. Um, you know, highlighting that we're a year and a half into a split of, you know, a major corporation into two smaller Fortune, you know, 50 companies. Um, huge change, but, you know, great for the better. We're much more nimbler. We're able to move in a faster and um, more innovative way focused on engineering and uh, delivering what absolutely amazes our customers. So we'll continue to do that. And we are um, very, very bullish about going after that $54 billion A3 market that we all here enjoy a little piece of. So thank you. So if you don't mind, I'd like to turn it over to the audience. I have some other questions, but I'd like for you to participate if you don't mind sooner rather than later. So questions? So earlier today we heard a lot from Xerox about apps in the machine, they're writing, third parties are writing. I remember your comments, both Doug and Rick, historically that you guys were out acquiring or developing. Can you give a quick update what your machines look like today and what you've done in the aggregation of other services and other products that come with it, just so I can see the landscape and include yeah, I, Doug and I both missed this morning. I, I'm glad to see after the Xerox and HP presentations that their unbelievable disruptive technology didn't put us all out of business. So I'm <laughs> frankly glad I'm still here. I, was, I thought this morning I'd be out. Uh, so I guess it's okay. But but I mean the apps that are being discussed at the at the machine we've had for a long time. We've had an app store, we've had our own development, we've hooked to third parties for a long time. Uh, we're very much diversifying our business to businesses around the, the, the print industry. So we have a very big IT service business that's doing great for us and we have a very big enterprise content management business that's growing dramatically and and a lot, a lot of software and services. So you know, we're driving a, a broader range of what we call total value add solutions to our customers to try to increase print volume and increase our, our machines in the field. And in fact, somebody asked about our, our, our volume, our print volume is still uh, expanding. And our number of machines in the field is still expanding through last month. So we're lucky. And I think partly is because we are, we're selling the customer a lot of stuff. And the last presentation was really germane to what we're doing in terms of trying to change from a transactional business to a contractual one where we're gonna sell you a lot of stuff on one invoice and you know, not great commitments. And, and you're not, I don't think you're gonna buy stuff like you have in the past from us. So we're trying to change a lot. I'm not sure that answers the question, but. Anybody else wanna take a stab at that question? Uh, yeah, same, same as Rick. OSA, I don't even know the year. I think uh, Evan Glockman would know the year, maybe more so than I would. But, uh, uh, 2002. 2002. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. God bless you. I've been leaning on you for 10 years now. Um, the, um, so the open system architecture is built into Sharp, so we've got all these app developers, and we've, we've taken a, um, a .NET stance from the beginning. Um, we've encouraged that. Uh, where a lot of companies stayed Java because they wanted to they wanted it to make it closed off and keep all the information there. We, we took that .NET OSA. So we're building not only our own apps and our own things to try to build this whole concept, which I've talked about until I've been blue in the face, around the smart office and doing the same thing Rick's talked about, which is we want to help you know dealers and we want to get into the office. We want to get products that are connected to the office, that are connected to the network. We want to manage that information flow. We want to make sure that information can go to each of those devices. And the only way you can do that is to have apps and partners that can help drive that whole equation. And that's that's kind of where we sit. We think it's very important. So uh, I'll sneak in another question. Recently, Rico sold off a bunch of Myth and branches or some combination therein. 
and how do you interpret that action? So Rick and I are in those meetings. Um, <laughs> 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 we, we totally disagreed on that. Wouldn't that wouldn't surprise me, actually. <laughs> I'll let somebody else answer that. <laughs> no, this is, you know, if you follow this industry for a long time, this is just a cycle. Uh, manufacturer, they start with direct, then they go to dealers, they get rid of direct, and then back in the early 90s with the Icon, Danka, the, the manufacturers got scared, went back to direct, and this is just a, in my view, poor management by Rico in when they bought Lanier, they had Lanier run the direct operation, they were dissatisfied with that, they end up buying Icon, had Icon run the direct operation, they were dissatisfied with that, and they allow them to drive the price down. So their branches are not profitable. There's no way they're gonna pull this up. And so the only thing they had left to do is sell off all their branches to their dealers, something like 80 cents on the dollar, get rid of 15 or 1,700 people, and hopefully that RICO will find a way to be profitable without that anchor with them. That's, that's my view. It's a little, little, it's a little, disingenuous to answer this without Rico sitting up here to defend himself, I think. That's so, I like it. But the funny, the funny <laughs> I like it. So, by the way, by the way, so do I. Let me finish. <laughs> you, know, you know, we're all public companies. And so, even though we do dealer meetings and we stand up and someone says, we grew 70% in segment three color for machines that had two paper sources and duplex and three paper you know, you can see the full numbers. So Rico's, Rico's numbers, our numbers, everybody's are out there to look at, the real numbers. And so that action was based upon real results globally for Rico and needing to take an action. And that's the one they chose. And it's not the one that I would have chosen, but it's it's an action and they, they, they're they trying to improve profitability. Um, but there's very direct comments from them about their profitability in their financial that you can read about what they did in price, what they did in price in North America, and how that worked out for them. So Fair that, that, that's an action that they took, and I think that's fine. I will say that, Jimmy, our direct operation makes a lot of money. So we put them on a, on a dealer cost P&L nine, nine years ago, and they make a lot of money because we forced them to make money on a dealer cost model. And so you know we have been able to, to manage channel conflict and grow very big dealers, according to Frank Connett's thing biggest growth of anybody last year um, and largest average dealer size and very profitable branches. So it's it's hard to do and you have to fire a lot of people on the way who don't get it on the direct side, but you can do it. Yeah, you can sure. do it, yeah. So if you can't do it, then, you, then it's a problem. You know, then, every, then everything goes down. So again, any other questions before I move to any of mine? Frank. I'd like to ask Mimi a question because from my perspective, I've come to know Mimi, and she's been working her tail off out in the field, talking to dealers about obviously what HP is doing with Samsung. What, what's been your general sense about the business environment as you've gone into some of the best dealers in the country? Um, so uh, just from a general perspective, high level, um, extremely positive, extremely bullish. Um, my perspective is, is that we're gonna see um, what I call the super eight get bigger and more stronger as we and with all of us right some of them we all you know are selling to simultaneously and we all knew, know who <clears throat> so the super eight or the super ten really are um, I think they're gonna get stronger I see acquisitions in their future um, I see tighter integration with bigger parts of technology for them um, expanding into um, IT infrastructure and um, us really helping them taking that next step into not only uh, you know printing, seed-based printing, some of the things that um, you know you guys over there are working on, um, which is super, um, I think, uh, very creative. But um, getting into a um, expanded seed-based billing that includes PCs, right? It's just not a, a print conversation anymore. It's a outside of the data center conversation, and that's where I see the best growth is for. You know some of these dealers that um, are expanding into um, you know IT infrastructure, but it's it's very positive. This business is really vibrant and happy and alive, 
Um, and uh, we're definitely seeing that from, you know, you know, the road shows that we've been on across the country. Thanks, Frank, for asking. Is uh, Miratech number seven or eight in this super? <laughs> 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 I think it's really cool to see HP and Xerox and, and, and uh, outside money, PE money, get into this game. I mean, it, it's cool that you, know, you get religion after 25 or 30 years and see the value of this channel because it's been valuable for a long time. And I think that's where a, a, good, a good piece of money ought to be invested and because of the way the business is going, the people that can be more creative closest to the customer have huge opportunity. So you talked about branches and big retail organizations. It's hard to be agile and, and, and create custom solutions for organizations, but when, when you're the dealer principal and you can make the decision in one minute how to customize a solution for a customer or put together partnerships, you got a big advantage. And so I think you're seeing smart money come from the sidelines. You're seeing companies decide that this is a really good place to invest when they've looked at other, they looked at other channels and now this is a good place to invest. I think that's good for dealers. More of us will be competing for that business, so. I mean, they're not gonna win, but this guy's never gonna compete for that business. Well, I agree with you. I think seeing that. About the winning part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the whole thing, bringing up, bring up, it's always a curiosity to me when you see VC money or PE money or investments coming into this industry, when for years we've heard, Prince dying, it's an old industry, it's gonna die, you know, people are, and yet here you see all this investment and I think it's specifically designed around what you're talking about. And I think there's a panel tomorrow, Steve is on it, I guess, but this, you know, this acquisition panel. Yes. I think you're gonna hear part of the attraction is the broadening of services being offered by the dealers. So whether it's different types of hardware or, or services, I think that is, is of interest to, to large companies that wanna to get to the SMB market and to people that like the residual nature of our business, be it prints or licenses or, you know, whatever we're trying to, uh, services in general. I think that's a really good thing. Well, along those, question, Jim? Question. So, please. So guys, I, you obviously know we remanufacture printer cartridges and we appreciate you guys uh, being out there because without you, we're, we're not in this business, but we remanufacture. Everybody appreciates you. <laughs> 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 we appreciate it. I'm not sure everybody appreciates it. I, I don't want to speak for you, but yeah, maybe. maybe, 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 maybe yeah, yeah. Here, here's my question, though. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. We, we remanufacture, and we spend a lot of time making sure that we do not <coughs> violate intellectual property. But yet, we're seeing the clone market drastic, drastic blatant copies of products. We collect 7 million cartridges a month, and about 15% of them are clones coming back. What, what are you guys doing about the clones that are you know, blatantly violating your IP, and when you introduce a new product, the product is cloned in a week, two weeks, three weeks after you've entered the market? I'm a year before I even affect my friends on the end there. <laughs> so, just curious about that. Well, I think everybody in the room knows Luxmark's never been shy about going after clones. Uh, you might be wondering, well, what about the new Lexmark? <laughs> <laughs> Which is a clone. Nobody <laughs> wondering. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering too. Apex, Nine Star, good luck with that. <laughs> so we're still learning exactly how all that shapes into the rest of the strategy. But, but our focus today is, is clearly on continuing with the best A4 platform. We have contracts with our dealers in the U.S. that uh, have helped both sides win. You know, and as it relates to future strategies, we're trying to understand, much like you know, Sharp and some of the others are trying to understand what they have available to them with some of these, uh, these new relationships. We have been doing quite well with the way that our relationship operates with our dealers. So your question was probably more pointed at HP. <laughs> Not necessarily. Yeah. It's, it's really everybody. It affects, yeah. it affects, it affects everybody. everybody. Answer, so. Um, but so from a worldwide perspective, we have um, a very bullish team that works with state and local authorities all over the world to shut down the cloning industry. Um, 
It, it's um, cloned remanufactured toners are second to cloned women's handbags, I think. Mm -hmm. It is a incredible business um, that um, you know we spend a lot of time, money, and effort shutting it down, and it's um, it's not easy. So there's lots of uh, different articles and whatnot uh, that you can read on the internet. There was just a um, FBI investigation of a uh, cloning company that we worked together um, to shut that entire facility down. So there's lots of examples of how we, uh, you know, use the military and the police, the FBI, things like that, in order to um, protect both you guys and and us. With, with our new model of fax machines we have coming out, <laughs> we're using thermal transfer paper. We hope they have this plus. Just fill them anyway, and please get it somewhere else. But you know, it's a good idea. Why do you think we're introducing We have a exactly. we have a question. Please get it. <laughs> Couple numbers, Jared. Um, so, so based on the uh, numbers, the trends uh, that uh, you guys closely follow, and I think they've probably gotten a lot better uh, over the years in terms of uh, predictability. Uh, the, the numbers of the machines that were, the new machines that are actually in place in the field, and I'm assuming that you've given everybody has really given a lot of thought to what the ideal mix of the distribution would be, and if you could share that, meaning um, what would be the ideal, ideal situation uh, between dealer and uh, direct, uh, if you had to pick you know, that, that ideal situation, because you know, clearly there is advantages to both. There is an advantage to a dealer dis uh, distribution, you know, even if it's not a, you know, a single line dealer. And um, there are other, you know, advantages from the safety side and so forth for the direct uh, distribution. So, is there an ideal number of when you guys sit around and noodle it out um, about um, what it would look like if it were perfect? I think you just look for a lower quota for the number. <laughs> that might be Yeah, he's, he's mine. Yeah. Um, I, I would have to say, well, we're 35 in direct, 65. I'm sorry, 35 direct, 65 indirect. So um, of course we think that's ideal. Um, look, there's advantages to both. When I got into the job, our, uh, lo and behold, the direct operation was hemorrhaging money, which is unfathomable. It's, it just makes absolutely no sense. Um, but as Rick said, you know, the direct touch to the customer, the direct touch to being able to understand what's happening in the market, there's a big advantage to that, right? We do the same exact thing. We treat our directs as a dealer. We, we give them the same pricing as we would to one of our dealer partners. Uh, we treat them as a sharp only dealer um, so that they can't take it to the street. But um, you know, for, for us, it's, it's a great set for us to have data. We can control things a little bit more. But we also have a, over 100 sharp only dealers in the market. And that's, I think, I still think we have the largest dedicated single line dealers of any A3 manufacturer. That's very. That's a big advantage for us as well. That's. It's easy. The only problem with that it's easy for you know other these guys to to pick them off and go buy them. Um, so that that's been a little bit problematic for us. And I think I think that's the bigger issue right now is the direct. Um, we don't have to sell them. I guess unless you're Rico, uh, but we don't we don't sell them. Um, but the problem is that what's happening to the dealer channel. I've never seen so much. Um, acquisition on dealer to dealer and that that's it, we track that we track what manufacturers buy what dealers and we track what dealers buy what dealers and, and it's clearly the majority of acquisitions now are dealer on dealer and that puts us in a really tough spot because where you've got a very good authorization grid and where you've done a very good job to keep that channel integrity now becomes a very challenging job because you may have a sharp only dealer get bought by a Konica and Rico dealer and you know we don't we don't make a practice of canceling them because we put customer first, but it creates a difficult challenge for us. So I don't know what the ideal mix is. We feel we have it today, but if we had more direct today, we would feel a little bit more comfortable because many of our dealers are being picked off or being acquired. Um, and we haven't played as aggressively as I'd like in that game, um, but that's the reality of the game and that's the market and that, that's the way it goes. With, um, 
With three dealerships in the United States with sales over $250 million a year and their growing influence, how do you assure the rest of your channel that they're getting treated equally and fairly? <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I still to all of them, all those guys are, are in fact, uh, I think that's what you're talking about. The largest majority of their sales are our products. And, you know, like I said about our direct and dealer channel, we have tried to keep the opportunity to go get an end user equal across the board. And so we can't, we can't make the large companies, uh, dominate markets where smaller dealers are. So we have to have to manage that. But honestly, our dealer, I, we have canceled since I've been on board about 175 dealers. So we had, well, our bigger problem was everybody sold it and the branches sold it and they, and so we have a very orderly distribution now. And yeah, we, just, we, have, we have to work every day to make sure that everybody has the opportunity or you just lose them all. We wouldn't have, but our, our medium sized dealers are growing a lot or small, we have some small dealers that are growing a lot. Um, I, to answer Jerry's question, we don't have a, just a, so I don't know if that helps at all. We have to keep it, we have to keep it. And then these guys with law degrees keep an eye on us. You might know some of them. And so we have to do that right. Um, it just, it just we, you know, this is a small industry and your reputation is well earned. So you can screw up in a marketplace and that is wildfire across the country. And so we've got to be careful every day that we treat everybody fairly and, and that we give everybody the opportunity. It's, you know, the, the, the old saying, what's good for the individual customer is good for everybody. And that's kind of what it is. So we give a choice of, of options. Jerry, I didn't want to dodge your question earlier. We have about 50-50 direct and dealer. It's just gone that way. We don't have a strategy. I mean, it's 50-50 units. We sell a few more uh, units to dealers than direct, so 55, 45, but the revenue in direct is big because we have retail revenue. We, we look at a market, we try to get a market share, we try to figure out the best way we can go after that. So, you know, we, if that's adding more dealer distribution, we do. If it's adding more, uh, if that's adding direct sales, we'll figure that. But our direct guys are kind of focused in a different market. They're focused a little higher end, more enterprise, more uh, a, a bigger market, and, and you know, dealers are across the board, SMB and, and dealer for us. So, it's it's working for us. We're, but I, I like. I mean, I'm not, we're not trying to drastically change or alter that in any way. I'm not trying to add much more dealers. I'm not expanding branches other than through acquisition. If we want to buy somebody. Other questions? Yeah, I, 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 Mike. Oh, got it, Luke. So th this is uh, this is for HP. You know, there was a, a lot of talk today. You know, in your in HP's presentation and some of the sound bites from Dion Weiser about disrupting the fifty-five million dollar A3 copier market. So I guess it's a two-part question. You know, one. Just go one at a time. That's <laughs> uh, so the, the first part is is you know you have a lot of entrenched A3 players, Conic and Rolta, Sharp, Xerox, Rico. You know that have that have been at it for you know 30 years. That have a, a, a you know great market share, very loyal dealers. So I guess the question is, it wasn't really clear to me how you're going to go about that disruption. What about the products are going to be so attractive to dealers that they would look at your A3 products when they've been, you know, a sharp house or a KM house for so many years? Yeah, so it's actually a really great question. So um, if you take a look at HP's channel in general, <clears throat> I, I put it into two different segments. We have what we call our incumbent channel, and then we have a relatively new channel. And um, the new channel would be, you know, some of the folks um, that haven't, maybe in this room that haven't heard from HP in quite a while. But we also have this very large incumbent channel, um, and they could potentially have a boutique A3 business inside of that incumbent channel. That's really the sticky part for us, is to work with them to teach them how to move forward in a more mainstream A3 selling motion, and not to have it become, to grow it from a boutique channel for them or a boutique offering to a much larger and expanded offering so so that's one disruptive you know portion that we're working on from a technology perspective um, there is um, you know several different things and the very first thing that I would say is um, we have a full broad portfolio of product 
we go all the way from consumer all the way up to a very large um, press product. In this particular cons uh, channel that um, you know that I'm responsible for, um, we are uh, you know all the business to business type of, of products. In the very near future, they will have a similar interface, user interface. Okay, um, that you know not a lot of the other manufacturers you know have the ability to say that from you know, market share leader in A4, <clears throat> all the way up to a non-market share leader in A3 has, you know, the ability to do that. Uh, the other thing is bringing our full line of technology into a different buying experience to our channel that the channel hasn't ever seen before. So we don't talk really a lot about that in, you know, the press releases and whatnot, that's more of a private conversation that we have with the partners and how we can actually go in and help them with um, you know, several different processes to help them become more efficient in buying their whole entire suite of product from us. So it's not just A3 and like the technology around it, but it's an entire process how our partners can buy our entire portfolio of products from us. And not just on print, but on PCs as well. Thank you. So I'll throw a question out there if you don't mind. Get away from print for a minute. So when you look at the, the, the community that we serve, right? I mean, you have three to 5,000 independent dealers, some being bought, some being sold, somehow picked in the mix. You have people like Visual Eds or Dex or some of these great big dealerships that are they're really expanding their footprint. Some of the dealers, like Perry, they're moving into digital cops or solutions. And then when you look at the adjacent markets, there are depending on whose numbers you believe, in our profile, somewhere between 45,000 and 85,000 IT bars moving into print or moving into hardware. So when you think about your footprint and you think about your strategy for solutions and adjacent markets and how you identify people like Perry as your targets for the future, as an example, not that I want to cite them as the example, but they're doing things in adjacent markets that most people are not. Do you factor that into your, your overall solution strategy? How do you look at that IT bar mar market? Or is it just part of your, your footprint? Is it separate? Or is it part of? Well, for, for Sharp, it's part of, because we've, we've got a, a very, very burgeoning, nice display business right now. And that's, that's we sell probably 95% of that in the classic bar space, right? Um, so why does that matter? We're doing IWBs and there's a lot of information on electronic whiteboards that needs to be moved to a copier that might be even moved to a water machine, if you will, mm -hmm. that creates water by taking humidity out of the air. So anything that touches the office that's connected to a network is something that, that is vital for us. One of the things that Foxconn has brought to us, which is absolutely critical, is they make 47% of all electronic devices in the world. So they are about a $150 billion company. So you think about that. So if you think about products, Cisco's and other brands, um, well-known brands that you buy every day, that's probably coming somewhere out of a Foxconn factory. So for us, we looked at that and we said, gee, that, that gives us the ability to do a lot of things, much more than what we're doing today around display and around print. And that gives our partners an, an incredible advantage. So one of the things we did was we moved, we did, we, we moved to one platform we moved to tech data, I got a lot of criticism for that, but we did it so that we could take all of those products, put it on one PO, be able to order it off of one portal, and get it to one location, to where the, whether it's a bar, whether it's a, a, a traditional dealer, whether it's a direct sharp location, it didn't matter. Because it was all about being able to get a solution to a customer quickly and efficiently, and that's what we did. And I think that's where it's at, and I think if I'm, if I'm, if you look at the chaos and you look at what a lot of us are talking about here, there is a lot of opportunity, but there is no opportunity if you don't diversify your thinking and if you don't think about what you're doing and how you can do that moving forward, how you can touch more of what your customers are buying. If you can't figure that out, you're in a whole lot of trouble. I think that's what I would tell you. And I think whether it's an OEM or whether it's a dealer, you're in a whole lot of trouble. I mean, I've heard a lot. I won't be here for Rick's tomorrow because we have kind of a gentleman's agreement. Be kind of, but he'll do a great job of talking about where they, he doesn't have it. I, I have not. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> it's the gentlemen's agreement. I'm a gentleman. Um, yeah. That's a sure trick. But, but you will talk about a lot of things they're doing. They're diversifying their business aggressively. I, I would I would say he's doing a great job of doing that. You're going to hear a lot about that tomorrow. And I think it's important for everybody to do that because you're dead if you don't. I mean, that's 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 my sobering, uplifting, go have a beer. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if you're an owner of a dealership and you're not doing what the manufacturers are doing, which is working on your business and looking five years ahead, you will be out of business. I mean, and that's what we realize. Uh, Little Miratech, we're not going to survive going head to head against these these giants. So I'll, I'll never have the economy to scale. So for us to survive, for some of you guys, you've got to figure out what other adjacencies you can bring in and you can manage in the next five years. Because you're going to see the continued maturation of our industry. And so you're going to have to move into something, whether it's IT services, managed print, in our case, legal printing, and there's going to be other things out there. So stop working in your business, on your business, and start working on your business. So you need to get out and look out and figure out a five-year plan, or you'll be sold to Visual Edge or Sharp or kind of get a little bit of face. It's another beer moment. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people up here talking about hardware, right? You've heard, you know, I, I got a new control panel, I got a new hardware, my A3, my A4, <coughs> that, and that makes me so happy because because that, I, I think hardware is has become commoditized, need to be commoditized. And, HP's trying to make a security uh, disruption to our company. I welcome it. Come on in, and we'll go head to head with. Security. But I think the services piece: how are you going to manage these devices, and how are you going to bill for that, and how are you going to manage mobility and all, and the, the changing workforce. The, as you talked about, people at home, the the commuting workforce it's just changing dramatically. And so, to enable that is not totally about hardware. It's a little bit about hardware. And then the services that you wrap around that. So you mentioned Perry, who's doing a lot of nice things with services, and, and you mentioned the, the big business. So Marco has a big services business, and I think a, a lot of our dealers, we sort of brought them into that area, and, and they're doing well. They're, they're diversifying the offering, and you can't commoditize that. You can't compare that lease and that CPC or seat. That's what seat billing's doing. It's, trying to decommoditize a business that's become commoditized. So the more everybody talks about the new control panel, and you know, there's a, I'm, I'm, many of you know I'm from Kansas, and this one of my favorite bumper stickers is, you just entered Kansas, please set your clock back 15 years. And, and, and as, I, as I watch some of these presentations from the biggest guy, I feel like I'm in 1995. When you're talking about apps, and you're talking about apps, and to the, that's fantastic for me, the more the, the, the people talk about hardware, because that's going to be an enabler, but it's not going to be where the business goes. This is a consumption society, and so people aren't going to buy hardware. You know, they're, they're, going, to, they're going to use it when they need it, and they're going to change the way that the, the relationship is. So Forza, to build something more elegantly and to combine different products beyond our traditional, is, we think, a smart thing, as you know, and, and trying to help there. We're spending a lot of money on our IT system to be able to have a different relationship with our customers and build differently, and, and that's not going to be hardware related. So, you know, we'll see. So, the ability to build at the end of the day is really the key, right? Efficiency and growth. So, did you want to add anything or take another question? I, I think we have a little bit of time left for a couple more questions, right? I can't see through the light, so I apologize. No? No, okay. I think good. No? Okay, so I'll take. How much time do we have left? None. None? Okay. So, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at that, but that's yeah. been flashing a while, so I don't know. So, I mean, I'll, ask, time for a while. I'll, I'll ask the, the last question. If you, have, you, you, you've been giving great counsel to them, and it's, it's obviously very well received. Um, when you talk about looking five years out, what would you recommend they be doing five years out? I mean, specifically. Anyone grab it? Yeah. It's got to be something they can commit to, is what I said earlier. If, if they're not committed to it, they keep dabbling in this, or they don't have the resources to go all in on managed IT services, or 
They don't have the resources to go after a vertical approach. I mean, they need to do what they're good at. And, and I think that's going to be the separation because the acquisitions aren't stopping. And, you know, that might be the exit strategy to set themselves up for an acquisition. That's, that's a great exit strategy. But to be here five years from now, they've got to evolve. They've got to be able to do it well and be committed. Rick, take it down. I always find it interesting when you did no offense against that question. <laughs> but I, I just it changed went, his name. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. It's I always good. find it interesting when you ask that question, and no offense, but because um, I don't know, I, I would be the worst person to tell these guys about how to run their business in five years. <laughs> they're in this room because they've been very successful, and um, so I mean, I think they're going to diversify. They're going to get a great strategy. They're going to get the right people, and they're going to do what they do well. I, I'm glad you actually just rudely interrupted, and I think that's great. <laughs> um, I, I think we have a diff different answer. I think it's our responsibility to provide leadership. You know, we have resources, and we can we can fail quicker, we can fail bigger than a dealer can fail. So, the reason you have direct branches is to go out there and and push the envelope and try something, and it either works or it doesn't work, and you can expand that. So, I think looking at the way business is changing today, I would listen to your customers because. I get to go on a lot of really cool sales calls like all these guys do with presidents of companies. And when I talk about our core business or giving better break fix service, I mean, they couldn't glaze over fast enough. And the best thing I can get out of that meeting is, you know, next time we bid it, you guys are right there, you know, whatever. But if I talk about how their businesses are changing and how they're putting computing power closer to their offices and how they're changing the, work, the workspace that they work in, new people get invited in the room. And things change a lot, and if we can enable that, trans that, that transition of how the workforce is is, um, is working today, and make that more efficient. There's huge opportunity, and those numbers are bigger than the MFP number being talked about. Dramatically bigger if you get out of those kind of spaces. So, I would I would really listen to my customers, and I would I would listen to everybody up here with the, exactly the dealer approach. I get that bullshit meter so high. And, and, if, and if we're not investing in it and asking you to do it, I would question that. So if somebody's saying do something and the, and the OEMs aren't investing in it, I go, wait a minute, if you're not doing it, why should I do that? Are you sure that I should do that? And, and as, a, as a person that's been in a, in a manufacturer out company for a long time, they send us a lot of stuff to sell. Then I look at them and go, are you kidding me? And you know, so you have to have some credibility and I might run through, through with you guys some products that were ridiculous over the last 30 years I had that no one was ever going to buy. And so if this manufacturing out philosophy is over, and, and most companies, I'm sure all these companies, are looking at what the consumer, the customer needs and building for that. And, and again, I think the best person to implement that is, is a dealer organization. I do believe that flexibility and that creativity and the ability to say yes immediately, or, or no, or, or, or build a solution is, is tremendous there. And, and it's, I think it's good that other companies and other investors are putting their money in the same place, that they're seeing that. So if I were a dealer today, I'd be fired up, but I would, I would not be complacent. <coughs> I would look for opportunities and I'd, I'd go. Okay, thanks Rick. I think we have Jim and Mimi, so Jim. Okay, I, I mind would really quick. Pick good partners. You can't do all the stuff yourself. You, you, you need someone to help you build out your infrastructure. So you have a lot of good companies that you can partner with. Make sure that they can service you, that they're good, and you'll, you'll, you'll do very, very well. And that's what these meetings are about, to learn what these other companies can do for one another, for each other. Is it easy? Good answer. Mimi? Yeah, I just, um, one of the things that I would say is maybe a best practice, right, is to look outside of your industry. Um, there's so many times that I go and I visit with partners and um, they ask me, well, where else are you going in the, in the area? And I'll say, oh, I'm going, I'm going here or I'm going there. And um, they're like, I've never heard of that company before. And I'm like, yeah, they're a you know, $100 million HP partner and they're in your backyard. And they don't know who they are. So um, that would be one of the things that you know, I would look to is to diversify you know, your, the business a little. Look at other things, look at other 
um, partners maybe that are selling um, something that's complementary to what you're selling and seeing exactly what they're doing. Um, invest in other um, you know, trade shows or other types of IT industry events um, that are held by some manufacturers that maybe that you aren't um, working with um, you know, specifically today just to get a different perspective on the IT industry itself. So, how about a round of applause for our panelists?